7.30 a.m. on this morning. It is shaping up to be a hellishly hot day, as I'm sure um, those of you who spent any time in this part of the world in January can attest, it gets very, very hot up here. It was estimated that the mercury would have sat between 40 and 45 degrees Celsius in the shade. There's almost no shade on this battlefield. And the men are sitting down below us, having a, or enjoying a late campaign breakfast. I say enjoying through very gritted teeth. Um, it consisted of stiff maize porridge with lumps of bully beef floating in it. Try and appreciate what these men are wearing. Steel shod and hobnailed boots, thick blue woolen trousers, a flannel undershirt, and on top of that, a quarter inch thick red serge tunic buttoned up to the collar. And at this very instant, there were 25,000 Zulu warriors in full regalia and full formation about to hit this camp. When these men look up at the plateau again, but this time by the right of the plateau at the notch, Gardner tells us he saw a thin black snake coming over the skyline. He said we picked up our glasses. We saw to our horror that that snake was made up of Zulus, hundreds of them. The snake had a distinct head and that head was making directly for Major Francis Broadford Russell and his rocket battery. And one can imagine the scene out there with the Major. As these men fumble with this rocket battery, they get the, tri the, the bipod and the trough set up. They take a rocket out of the box, they place it in the trough, they pull the string. They set this device off and it curls through the azure sky. One imagines quite arbitrarily. And it lands slap bang in and amongst the advancing Zulus and it explodes. Blowing those poor souls to kingdom come. But the Zulus never flinched. This was a very different enemy, this one. These were not the tribes that ran. These were the Amazulu. These were the little children of the sky. Fear was not in their repertoire when they were fighting. Four and a half thousand strong is the right horn of the Zulu army. The force fighting against Dernford and the Donga, five and a half thousand strong, that is the left horn of the Zulu army. And the masses, those 15,000 warriors, several thousand women and several thousand Utibi boys up there on the heights, that is the head and the chest of the Zulu army. And I put it to you that up until this point, British High Command never believed for one instance that the Zulus could deploy their tactic on this sort of enormous scale with the horns five miles apart. I think for far too long this battle has been spoken about, written about, debated as a great British blunder. I think it is high time that we appraise this battle for what it really is. This is a great Zulu victory. This battle was won, and it was won at enormous cost. And I think it is high time that we arrogant English-speaking people learn to duff our hats to men like in Chengwai or Gamakhole Koza, the Zulu commander-in-chief. And when he saw that the horns of his buffalo were in position, he rose up to his impressive full height, and he bellowed at his staff officers sitting behind him on the rocks. He screamed, I saw me, I again, hebe! And 15,000 men replied in unison, punctuating their cries by slamming their weaponry into the leather of their shields. Usutu, Usutu, Usutu. And the command ripples out that these grandsons of Shaka could now descend into this killing field. The descent of the Zulu force from this plateau, we are told, was orchestrated with the precision that would have done justice to a military tattoo. The Zulus chanting these great rhythmic chants across the hills, stamping their feet with these enormous stamps that almost seemed to shake the earth itself. And thousands upon thousands of udulating women swarmed up onto the mountainside, spurring their menfolk on with their blood curdling cries. The San Juana has little changed. This is one of those precious places where, we're if one. Uh, fuzzes one's focus if one allows this unchanged topography to do its work of hypnosis you can walk off this battlefield not with an appreciation of what it might have been like but with an appreciation of what it must have been like